year of having the pleasure of introducing our honored guest today and the amateur sleuth that he's created. Um, and I think maybe it's in his own likeness, but I'm not quite sure. Um, no, you were talking about that. No, no, you don't have khakis on today, so no, I guess that's a difference. Um, since the 2012 or 11 Gaither Book Book Festival, when we left the khaki clad Carter Ross, the investigative journalist who stars in our guest's award-winning mystery novels, he had another life-risking uh, adventure to get the real story for his paper, The Eagle, um, New Jersey Eagle Examiner. In his latest book, The Girl Next Door, which was released in March, Carter seeks to uncover the truth behind how a delivery woman for his own newspaper died in what appeared to be a tragic hit-and-run accident early one morning. But as Carter soon finds out, it was no accident at all, and he would too soon be starring, staring into the headlights of the murderer's car. Since our author's appearance here last year, we've also found out a bit more about Carter's early career and how he got to start at the Eagle Examiner through a short story entitled Nightgown. Brad's stories are compelling, exciting, and filled with surprise and intrigue around every corner. And this last one kept me on edge as I took my morning walk and I heard the sound of car engines revving as one came up behind me. Before Brad came, comes up on stage, I also want to extend a personal word of thanks to him for his contributions to this year's festival. In addition to working on his fourth, fifth, and, and sixth, Okay. Okay. <laughs> Brad assisted this by providing us the opening lines for our high school short story contest. The contest attracted more than 140 students from around D.C. and 14 counties in Maryland and Virginia. But his work didn't stop there. We keep him busy. He served as judge and selected winners along with novelist Jennifer Miller, who's also here today discussing her first book, The Year of the Gadfly. Please join with me in welcoming Brad Parks to the Gaither Book Book Festival. I'm a little disappointed, Gail. Uh, last year when Gail introduced me, she uh, she announced that she had a major crush on my main character, um, which which made for a much saucier introduction. I gotta say, you know. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, and, uh, is your husband big? Like, okay. Well, yeah, no problem. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Gotcha. Well, anyway. Hi everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for coming. It's. I'm glad that you found the mystery pavilion here. We are. Uh, we're kind of like in the ghetto this year. You know, they've like shoved us way down the hill in this shady spot where nobody can see us. Where dark, mysterious, evil things might happen. Uh, this is, of course, how the uh, the, the brain of a, a mystery writer works. I was looking at this tree, going, you know. I bet they hung somebody from this tree once upon a time. I just, you know, this is how I'm, I'm going to adjust this just because my mama made me tall. So there we go. Uh, so it's great to be here. This is uh, sort of at the end of a long book tour for me uh, that, like most book tours, has had, um, I suppose you could say, mixed results. Uh, my, my first uh, show was at a Barnes & Noble in Clifton, New Jersey. This was one of the largest Barnes & Nobles in the world and four people showed up to see me. And two of them didn't even count because it was a friend of mine and she brought her dad along, right? So uh, so nevertheless, you know, my, I always figured, hey, you know, four people showed up, my job is to give them a good time, so I, I kind of started getting into talking about my book, and uh, a, a, a few people who were just in the store kind of started wandering up, and I was kind of feeling good about myself, because look, they're, they're interested in what I have to say. And, uh, and this one guy in particular was really kind of into it, and uh, afterwards he comes up and he says, Will you sign a book? He was a Jersey guy. He said, hey, will you sign a book for me? I was like, yes, yeah, that's what I'm here to do. And he goes, good, sign this one. And he hauls a James Patterson out of his pocket. <laughs> yeah, so uh, from there, uh, actually, he then proceeded to give me a handwriting analysis, right? Which is like, I, I was just kind of like seeing where this would go, you know? <laughs> like, okay. And he, and he, you know, so I sign and he's looking at it and he goes, I can tell you're very creative. I'm like, really? I'm standing next to a stack of books that I wrote, and you can tell from my handwriting that I'm creative. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, anyhow, then next I went on to uh, San Francisco, where I was uh, uh, walking to my, one of my signings one night, and I was kind of waiting in a light, and there were these two guys kind of hanging out in a, kind of like in a stoop, and, and they start harassing the woman next to me, right? You know, hey, cutie, you're looking good tonight, like all this kind of stuff. And I was like, really? In 2012, we're really objectifying women like this. And I, I was really getting angry about it. And then one of them goes, and I really like that blazer on you. <laughs> and that's when I realized they were objectifying me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a raging success. Um, and, then, uh, and then I had an event uh, maybe two weeks ago. It was for the... Uh, uh, the AAUW, the American Association of University Women, right? It was a, um, it was at a country club in Connecticut. So 184 women and me, 
right? However, they also they had invited two other authors as well, uh, both women, of course, and you know, so I'm making jokes like, well, I I guess I don't have to worry about a line at the men's room. <laughs> well, silence. And uh, but um, I had been talking with oh, so anyway, these two other women who were with me. Uh, one of them is uh, Dorothy Wickenden, who is the executive editor of the New Yorker, right? And I'm like. I subscribe to the New Yorker. Does that count for anything? The other was a woman named Ellen Feldman, whose books have been translated into nine languages. And I'm like, my books have barely been translated into English. And I suddenly started realizing that this was a setup. I was being put in front of the American Association of University Women to prove the inferiority of my gender. Like I was just, I was their stooge. Uh, and I, it, it actually got worse the, the, the day before I was talking to my mom. Like, oh, honey, what, you know, what are you doing on tour next? And I said, oh, I'm going to this AAUW event. And she's like, oh, I, I actually applied for a scholarship from the AAUW when I was in grad school. And I was thinking, okay, finally I have something to say to these women. Because I can say, hey, look, I'm the beneficiary of your largesse, and, and, and this will be a, a wonderful little story that I can you know, use to you know, get some amount of sympathy from these women or something like that. And then mom adds, oh, I didn't actually get it. It's like, oh. So yeah, I was a, uh, a second generation disappointment to the AAUW. <laughs> uh, but so it's, it is great to be here in Gaithersburg for one reason in particular, because I'm about to say something I have never said at a book event before, no signing, anything like that. Go Orioles, all right? This guy's with me here, uh-huh. I, I am actually, uh, okay, they, they, nobody would know that. My books are set in, in New Jersey. I'm from Connecticut. I live in Virginia now, but I'm actually a lifelong Baltimore Orioles fan. And I have never gotten to brag about it. You know, I mean, they just, they haven't given me a lot, to, as, as you well know. So it's, it's great to be uh, uh, in Orioles country and, and, and walking tall and feeling good about it. So um, uh, I guess I am here to, to talk about a book that I wrote. Um, a lot of authors, that you'll, you'll, you've probably been at a presentation today where someone has asked the question, where do you get your ideas? You guys heard that question and it's actually a little bit of a running gag in the mystery community because we have no idea where we get our ideas most of the time. It's like, uh, uh except for this book, I know exactly where I was standing and exactly what I was doing. And then the train ran the man over. This is, this is, again, this is the mind of a mystery writer. You guys hear train and you think, oh, somebody must be traveling somewhere. I think murder weapon. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so I know exactly where I was standing when this book kind of first became a, a twinkling in my eye. Uh, it was July 30th, 2008, and the publisher of the newspaper where I was working at the time, the Newark Star Ledger up in New Jersey, had called all of us down to the classified advertising area to make a special announcement. And that was where he told us that our paper, which was then I think about the 11th largest paper in the country, was on life support. And it was going to be shut down at the end of the year unless several conditions were met. Uh, among them, we had to have a renegotiation of our contracts with our unions and they needed 150 newsroom personnel to take buyouts and, quote, voluntarily leave their jobs. I remember this day not only because it was the start of this book, but also because it was the end of my newspaper career. Um, for me, being a newspaper reporter was not just a uh, my job or an avocation or anything like that. It, it was really my identity. I mean, it, it was who I was. It was how I thought about the world. It, and it's what I've been doing since I was 14 years old, uh, which is when I, I got my first job in newspapers. Um, that job, uh, well, I always say that I got into writing for the money and the sex. And this is actually true because my first job in newspapers was to cover the Ridgefield High School girls basketball team. So the, the money part was that they were going to pay 50 cents a column inch, which meant I could make slightly more money babysit, uh, writing sports articles than I could babysitting. The, the sex part was, was obvious, although maybe not because I, this, this may be hard to envision for you, but uh, at the age of 14, I was not quite the strapping male specimen you see before you. Uh, I, w I was short, I was fat, I had braces. They, uh, you know, they don't make pants for short fat kids, so like the, the crotch of the pants, like, went to, like my knees. Yeah, I, I, was, I was not great shakes, but I figured, I'm like, wait a second. If I'm the guy who can put these girls' names in the newspaper, they'll have to talk to me, right? And then I can work my considerable charm on them and I'll get lots of dates and... 
Yeah, so that was uh, the first time uh, my writing career didn't quite work out the way I planned. Um, but it did get me into writing, and it did get me into storytelling, and it, it did kind of get me into newspapers. And I, and I thought I got into the whole game because I loved the girls. Oh, and I did. They were all, like, tall and blonde and gorgeous and all this sort of stuff. But I soon discovered, since the girl part wasn't working out, that the newspaper part was still pretty cool. Um, and uh, like I, I just I loved the deadlines. I loved the characters I met in the newsroom. I had this uh, one early editor who would always return your copy to you just a wash in red ink. Uh, forgive my language, but she called all of her reporters either. Um, was when she was in a bad mood. Was actually when she was in a good mood, right? So when she called you. You would kind of like walk back to your desk and you'd kind of feel all tall and proud. You'd elbow the guy next to you, hey, she called me a I, I must be doing a pretty good job here, right? Uh, so it was, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And um, well, Tom, ha have you ever wished that life was kind of like a Broadway musical? In what way? In, in that people would just sort of burst into song to explain how they feel about things. Well, for me, getting to know newspapers and falling in love with newspapers was sort of like, it had to be you, it had to be you, I've wandered around and finally found the somebody who could make me be true, could make me be blue, or even be glad just to be sad thinking of you, some others I've seen. Might never be mean, might never be cross, or try to be boss, you know they wouldn't do. For nobody else gave me a thrill, with all your faults I love you still. It had to be you, a wonderful you, it had to be you. I, uh... I have a dream that if this author thing doesn't work out, lounge act. Absolutely no question about it. Uh, so anyhow, I, uh, there I was as a young man falling in love with newspapers. And uh, I, I think I was realizing that not only were newspapers a lot of fun, they were also important. Uh, and so I, I went off to Dartmouth College and actually started my own newspaper. It was a weekly sports newspaper. Uh, I called it, wait for this title, The Sports Weekly. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yes, I'm very good with titles. And um, it was basically, I was the publisher, the editor, the ad salesman, the copy boy, the paste up boy. I, I did everything. I even drove it down to the printer on Monday morning, and it was, it was kind of my baby. And um, it, it, it was a lot of fun. And then uh, something happened my junior year in college, actually the summer between my junior and senior year. I was doing an internship at the Boston Globe, and I found out that a classmate of mine at Dartmouth, a woman named Sarah Devins, had committed suicide. Uh, Sarah was, without exaggeration, the best three-sport athlete in Dartmouth history. Uh, she was either first or second team All-American in field hockey, ice hockey, and lacrosse. And the summer before our senior year, she had made this tragic decision to kill herself. Uh, she was also from a very prominent family in Boston. So this was front page news for the Globe, and I actually wrote the front page story as, as a young intern. But then when it was time to do the, the follow-up story, you know, the kind of get the real story of what happened, the Globe, of course, sent a more seasoned reporter up to Dartmouth to kind of get this story. Um, I think Sports Illustrated sent a reporter as well. And they kind of came back with the very easy conclusion that it was the pressure of playing three sports at such a high level that had caused her to make this tragic decision. Except I knew Sarah, and I knew how much she loved her, her team and her teammates and the games. And besides which, if it's the pressure of playing three sports that gets to you, would you kill yourself in the summertime, which is the one time when you're not playing the sports? So I kind of had this doubt in my head. And when I got back on campus that fall, and mind you, I have complete editorial control over the newspaper that I run in my dorm room, I made my first assignment to myself to really get the Sarah Devon story. And I started uh, interviewing her coaches and her teammates. And about a month had passed, so I think some of the shock had worn off. And uh, well, a very different image of Sarah emerged. Um, she had a very difficult family life. Uh, her mom had actually left her dad for another woman. Uh, her dad was one of these relentless sports dads. You know, Sarah, you scored two goals. Why didn't you score three? Um, there had been a long history of depression. I mean, there, there was all this stuff. So in addition to writing kind of a tribute to what a wonderful athlete and what a great teammate she had been, 
I put this stuff in the newspaper. Well, that prominent family from Boston that I told you about uh, was not too pleased. Uh, in short order, they got one of the coaches I interviewed to retract all of his statements. They got the advisor of my paper to step down. They actually tried to get the paper shut down until the college's lawyers explained to them there was this thing called the First Amendment. You know, we kind of can't do that. And so as a 21-year-old kid, like kind of trying to find my way in journalism, I was, I was really rattled by this. But then something else started happening. I started getting all these letters, and this was in the hoary old days of the mid-90s when people still wrote letters, and they were all saying the same thing. Thank you. Thank you for telling us what was really going on. Thank you for helping us understand this a little better. And not that a not that a newspaper, I mean, you know, Sarah's death had been very painful for a lot of people in the community, and a, a newspaper article can't make you feel better about it. It, it probably can't make you really understand, I mean, because who can really understand why somebody makes that decision? But I think it, it helped people wrap their heads around this awful thing that had happened. And for me, seeing this reaction of people who were just grateful that someone had finally given them something that resembled the truth, it sort of made newspapers feel like a calling for me, like something I was really meant to do. And, um, well, I don't know, I guess it was sort of like uh, at a time when my classmates were heading into law or finance or medicine or kind of these conventional careers. I was going to be finding my own path, uh, much like the title character from Pippin, who once sang, Everything has its season, everything has its time. Show me the reason and I'll soon show you the rhyme. Cats fit on the windowsill, children fit in the snow. Why do I feel I don't fit in anywhere I go? Rivers belong where they can ramble. Eagles belong where they can fly. I've got to be where my spirit can run free. Gotta find my corner of the sky. Has, has anybody ever heard of that song, by the way? Do you guys know that song? You, a few people have. I, I, I've sang that song before, and I, I sometimes I get these blank looks, like nobody's had any. So I was kind of finding my corner of the sky, and it turned out it was in newspapers. So uh, a very uh, unwittingly fortunate thing happened, uh, little did I know, but the Washington Post, a, uh, a small newspaper in our nation's capital, some of you may be familiar with, had actually also sent a reporter up to Hanover, New Hampshire to quote, get the Sarah Devon story, and that reporter had come back empty-handed. So suddenly when I was applying for a job at the Washington Post that next spring, they hired me and they, they later told me it was based on that one clip more than anything else. So I started working for the Washington Post um, and it was a great, great paper to work for. I had a blast there. Uh, I could not pretend I was exactly one of their stars, okay? Like, because it was like the, the, the totem pole was, you know, the, the, you know there, there's Catherine Graham and there's Len Downey and I was actually somewhere beneath the totem pole. Um, they had me in Prince William County, Virginia. Uh, covering, oh, you're from Prince William County? Where'd you go to high school? No, no, it was just, it was not exactly the prime beat, is what I'm going to suggest. Covering high school sports in Prince William County. Uh, to the, actually, a, a, a funny little story. It, yeah, I'm not going to diss Prince William County, but um, David Remnick, I don't know if you guys remember David Remnick, um, wrote for the Washington Post for many years, but then switched to the New Yorker. And when Catherine Graham passed away, Remnick wrote a piece for the New Yorker about how when he had been Moscow bureau chief, um, he felt a lot of pressure when Catherine Graham came to visit because he knew if anything went wrong, he would be reassigned to cover high school sports in Prince William County. <laughs> I'm like, who did I piss off exactly? You know? but, so, uh, so anyhow, I, uh, I spent a couple years there and then uh, switched up to the New York Star Ledger for the chance to cover professional sports. And for six years, I covered literally every event that would ever be on your bucket list. The Masters, the Super Bowl, the World Series, the NBA Finals, you name it, I covered it. Uh, there were also some um, probably less prominent events uh, in my dossier, uh, like there was the Buff Bowl, which was a nude flag football game uh, contested at a, at a nudist colony, where I, uh, I discovered uh, two very important things that day. Um, one, the people who go to nudist colonies are not people you want to see naked. <laughs> not by any chance. And two, this was explained to me by one of the guys who was playing in the game, when playing naked flag football with other guys, you need to be really careful, it's the flag that you're grabbing. <laughs> Good thing to know. Um, 
So around the time I turned 30, I, uh, it was, you know, it was kind of, I'd gotten married, it was time to get off the road, and uh, an opening had come up on Newsside. And I thought, oh, okay, sure, it's time to grow up. You know, be a, be a real reporter. You know, the, the sports department, they always call it the toy department. So let's, let's leave the toy department, let's cover real news. Um, really not knowing, frankly, what I was getting myself into. Uh, because this is Newark, New Jersey, we're talking about. It ain't exactly Gaithersburg, folks, okay? Uh, it's a tough city. And I had, you know, I had kind of been around the city, and I, you know, I'd been working there, and, and sure, I had written stories about athletes who had gotten out of the inner city, and they would talk about how tough it was, but I really immersed myself in the place that was Newark, and in a way that I had not before. And, you know, so it would be like, you'd spend a whole day writing a story about a slumlord, who is keeping a building, uh, you know, he only turns on the boiler two hours a day, so there's no heat most of the time. Uh, there's, you know, you can hear the rats running around in the floorboards. There's sewage leaking in the basement. You know, and I, I spend a whole day just, you know, talking to people who live there. And it was like, you, you come home and you just feel empty, and but also charged and also outraged. You're like, how is this happening in the United States of America? You know, so I'd have experiences like that or, um, I, you know, interviewing, say, some, African-American grandmother, you know, 80-year-old black woman who was probably the, the daughter of sharecroppers, the great-granddaughter of sharecroppers, and the great uh, and the great great granddaughter of slaves, you know, who had come up from South Carolina. And her family had probably been in this, in this country for 20 generations without ever owning a stick of property, right? And for the kid, the spoiled white kid from Ridgefield, Connecticut, via the mean streets of Dartmouth College, um, you know, that was kind of eye-opening. But I also discovered something else about a lot of these folks I was meeting. They really weren't so different, you know, in terms of their aspirations, in terms of the things that were important to them, uh, in terms of the goals and dreams they had for their children. Um, and, and like, you, you started to realize that human beings are basically the same everywhere. And, and furthermore, I realized that, okay, so I'm interviewing that African-American grandmother. On the surface, we could not be more different, right? I'm a, a spoiled white kid from Connecticut. She's a grandma from New York. Like, but then we'd get talking, you know, and, and you'd make it known to them that, you know, like, I'm really actually interested in your story. I, I want to hear what you have to say. I want to I want to be able to represent your words. I want to be able to, you know, give your life meaning to people who are reading this newspaper. And suddenly all those differences between us don't matter. Like, it, it, was, it was constantly amazing to me how often the, the basic core of humanity that we all share would come out. And I guess I, I didn't realize this at the time, but... I was actually probably gathering some material for a good little series of gritty mysteries set in Newark. So like the first story that I did on Newside was a quadruple homicide. Four people shot in the back of the head, left for dead in a vacant lot in the south part of Newark. Which for any of you who may have read my first book, that should sound pretty familiar because that's how it starts. Four people shot in the back of the head, left for dead in a vacant lot. Uh, my second book is about uh, like subprime mortgages and house flipping and stuff like that, which coincidentally, I did a lot of reporting on subprime mortgages and house flipping and all this other kind of stuff. So, uh, And then, of course, we come around to July 30th, 2008, um, where I had been watching, of course, for several years as my newspaper, which I very much loved, was collapsing and was dying. Um, and I, I want to check what time. Okay, I've still got a little time. I sometimes veer off just to talk about the death of newspapers, both because it's personal to me, but also because I find that people who read books also read newspapers, uh, and it's happening all over. So that you know, the things that were obviously happening in Newark are happening to our fair Washington Post is happening. To, you know, they, it, it, it's it's really endemic. Uh, and there are kind of two things that people don't talk about a lot when it comes to the death of newspapers. And I guess I don't know. I'm, just trying to spread the gospel a little bit of, of what actually happened to newspapers. Um, the first thing that nobody ever talks about is actually the consolidation of retail. When you think about it, there used to be, um, you know, dozens of little small, say, regional electronic stores. They would have five, six, seven stores, something like that. They were great newspaper advertisers. But then Best Buy comes in and puts them all out of business. Hardware stores, same deal, you know, uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, you name it. Department stores, which were the best newspaper advertisers in the world. Think about how many department stores there used to be. And now there's just Macy's and or people owned by Macy's. Uh, so basically every time this would happen, some big box would come in, that would take five or six or seven really great accounts and replace it with one. And that was absolutely devastating to newspapers. The other thing is, of course, the internet and now your heads will nod, but not in the way you think. People think that the internet has taken newspaper readers. 
Not true at all. The Washington Post today is read by more people than have ever read it before if you combine the print and the online advertising and, and, and the online readership. No question has a much broader readership. What the internet actually stole was the classified advertising. Because you think about it, people used to sell their old junk on eBay. I'm sorry, they used to sell their old junk in the newspaper. Now they sell it on eBay. They used to get apartments in the newspaper. Now they do it online. They, cars, it's a now auto trader. You name it. You know, the Washington Post used to have a, a, a classified section as thick as a phone book every day. And now it's like two pages. And as an industry, classified was actually our entire profit margin. So the profit margin suddenly is gone at a time when the display advertising, which is supposed to be what's paying the bills, is also collapsing. So I was kind of reaching the conclusion actually long before um, it, the, the publisher on July 30th, 2008, came and delivered this bad news that probably it was going to be time for me to go. And so much like, well, the title character from Damn Yankees, Joe Hardy, who sang, Goodbye, old girl, my old girl, when you awaken, I'll be gone. Can't tell you where I go, it isn't fair, I know, but trust in me and carry on. Goodbye, old friend, my old friend. There's something I must let you know. I haven't said it much. I guess I've lost my touch. But my old girl, I love you so. Now I know it hasn't all been rosy. We've had squabbling days when tears were brought about. But in a moment or two, we would bill and coo, and never even knew what we fought about. And how your Joe has to go, but he'll come back to you again. So sleep your sleep, old girl, our love will keep, old girl, till then. Till then. Thank you. So yeah, it was time to go, but I wasn't exactly leaving without a backup plan. Because I'd always had this idea that it would be really cool, kind of someday when I was, you know, really, really, really old, like in my 50s, uh, that I would, I would quit the newspaper thing and start writing books, mysteries, something like that. Like that, that had always kind of been the back, like what a great semi-retirement career that would be after a long and glorious run as a major metropolitan newspaper columnist. Um, so I had kind of been dabbling, and actually I'd written a sports book uh, when I was in my 20s that I had used to help get an agent. As some of you know, getting an agent is kind of the first step in getting published. Uh, and she had really liked the book, but she said, you know, I'm not sure I can sell it. It's kind of an unusual book. Do you have anything else? Well, and it turns out I did, because I had been working on, I had about three chapters of this gritty murder mystery set in Newark. Uh, I had invented this protagonist who, um, admittedly, you, you may struggle to get the visuals of what this guy looks like. Uh, he, he's about six foot one, about 185 pounds, brown hair, blue eyes. <laughs> It's, 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 it, you, I just, I'm sorry, I can't, like, I, it's, it's hard to explain what you might, very handsome fellow. <laughs> um, so uh, I had, uh, I had given him a, a gay Cuban sidekick because I always wanted a gay Cuban sidekick, why not? Uh, I had kind of populated his newsroom with some of the irascible characters that I had met, although I still do need to use the editor who calls all reporters out. Like I, I need to work that in at some point. Uh, I had also given him a love interest. This, mind you, was probably the most difficult thing that I had to do because I have created this character very much in my own image. And I know my wife is going to be reading this stuff, right? So the last thing I wanted was for her to be like, oh, okay, wait, wait, wait a second, she's, uh, she's got brown hair and, and green eyes. And that, is, is that our neighbor, Peggy? Do you, do, you, do you have a crush on Peggy? Are you, what, what, what are you just living out your fantasies with Peggy in this book? You no, I, I didn't need that. So I, um, I invented this love interest, Tina Thompson, who was like nobody I'd ever met, nobody I'd ever dated, nobody I'd ever wanted to date, nothing like that. She's the one truly fictional creation in this whole thing. And then I kind of let it go. So uh, I showed this first three 
uh, chapters to my agent, and she said, I can sell that book. And sure enough, she did. I got the phone call, the call we all wait for, on July 8, 2008. So here it was, 22 days later, and the publisher is saying, we're on life support, we're about to pull the plug. And it was one of those times when it's like, all the arrows are suddenly pointing in the same direction. So uh, my wife and I had long talked about, like, if we knew newspapers were struggling, obviously, and what would we do? And we talked about the nuclear option, which the nuclear option was we would sell our house in New Jersey, and uh, my wife would get a job at a boarding school, and, uh, you know, because a boarding school is a, a great place for many reasons. Among them, you get to live on campus rent-free. Yeah, so as a, you know, as, as you may know, young authors don't necessarily... Well, I, I mean, I, I make millions of dollars, don't get me wrong. I just, um, I'm saving it for the children's education. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that this would kind of give me time to, to develop a new career. And, and certainly it's better if you're going to reinvent yourself in a new career, better to do it in your 30s than in your 40s or 50s or something like that. So, yeah, we, we exercise the nuclear option. So I'd had my first book written, and then, because that's the book that gets bought, of course. The second one I had to jam out really quickly, because I had suddenly signed this two-book contract, and the next book was due in January, uh, which actually was not the most pressing deadline at the time. Uh, my wife is actually due with our second child in December of that year. So, and I was basically starting this book in August. So, it, like, my mantra became book number two before baby number two, book number two before baby number two. And I, and I actually did get it done about three days before my daughter was born. So, whew, because of course I knew that the, um, based on the experience of the first child, no creative work was going to be getting done in the household for the first couple of months of that, that kid's life, and which, which is very true to life. But then it came time to sit down and write the third book, uh, after I'd done a little stint as a stay-at-home dad uh, in this little place that we lived, uh, Middlesex County, Virginia, very, very southern, like, tidewater part of Virginia. Uh, there's a, it's a county of about 10,000 people and three stoplights. I, I actually wasn't a stay-at-home dad in Middlesex County, Virginia. I was the stay-at-home dad in Middlesex County, Virginia. So it was it was very different. And there I am, um, you know, and suddenly I, I'm used to going into a newsroom every day with all these fascinating characters. Suddenly I'm just sitting in this cottage, you know, sitting in my underwear making stuff up, which is basically what mystery writers do. Uh, although, as a mystery writer friend of mine once pointed out, he said, you know, Brad, a job where you don't have to wear pants is a good job. <laughs> A job where you don't get to wear pants is a bad job. So make sure you hang on to the first one. Okay, got it. Uh, so anyway, but you know, I'm sitting down to write this third book, and there have been all these changes in my life. I'm, I'm living in a different place. I have a completely different lifestyle. I've left newspapers, which was my love, which is the thing I've been doing since I was 14 years old. And it was all because of July 30th, 2008, and what that publisher said. And it was almost kind of like a block in my head. Like, I needed to write about this before I could write about anything else. So sure enough, in The Girl Next Door, you have, um, well, a newspaper in financial trouble. And um, you have uh, unions uh, and, uh, and, a, and a tense union negotiation. I know this may stretch the imagination, but organized labor in New Jersey has a may have some violence associated with this. I know. I just try to suspend your disbelief when you get to that part, OK? Uh, and then, of course, there's also a publisher character who well, maybe if you don't like very much, maybe that's not an accident. This, of course, is one of the best things about being a mystery writer. If there's somebody in your life who you don't like, you get to make them a character in your book and do bad things to them. That's awesome. And, and this goes to, like, big characters like a publisher, but also to, like, you know that, that cable guy who said he would be at your house between 8 and noon and then doesn't show up until 5.30? You're like, oh, hi, nice to see you. Um, What's your name, sir? <laughs> and then the next morning, you kill him with a nail gun. You know, like, ha, 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 late for me. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, it's, it's, it's very cathartic, trust me. That's, that's why I'm in such a good mood most of the time, because I can just, anybody pisses me off, I can just put him in the book and kill him. <laughs> it's, it's very nice. So, um, so yeah, so I uh, out, out came this book, The Girl Next Door. And um, it is, uh, despite my misadventures occasionally on book tour, it, it has been a, a wonderful time and a wonderful book. And uh, I have enjoyed greatly talking to you. I know I, I need to wrap up. Oh, the, there's the five-minute sign. Am I good or what? I'm landing this plane right on time, baby. Uh, which means we've left about five minutes for questions. So I would love to take your questions. Yes, sir? Are there any MP3s of you singing in your e-books? Are there any MP3s of me singing in my e-books? No, but that's a good idea. Unless, unless you think that would drag down sales. I'm not sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, we'll, we'll find out. When, when, when the fourth book ends up tanking, I'm blaming you, Tom Kaufman. <laughs> yes, I do, yeah. Other questions? Oh, yes, sir. I wonder if you were graduating from college today and you felt the same sort of calling that you did when you graduated from college, did everybody hear that question? If I graduated from college, what sort of career options? Boy, it wouldn't be newspapers, that's for sure. I mean, my mama didn't raise a complete dumb guy, you know. Um, it's and, and that's actually, you know, people ask sometimes, well, have you ever thought about teaching journalism, something like that? I'm not sure I could do it with a straight face, because, like, you're going to send these kids off to what? You know, I mean... The, the Star Ledger right now has a, a program where they're paying kids like 500 bucks a week to come slave for them. Like 500 bucks a week? Like do you put food stamps in with their check? I mean, you know, so it's it's tough out there. I mean, I, I sort of hope that newspapers are going to figure it out. Cause I, of course, I think they're vital to democracy and all that other kind of good stuff. But boy, it's, it's rough right now, for sure. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, if I graduated today, well, I'd probably just go be a lawyer like everybody else. <laughs> Other questions? Put in a good word for the next act. Oh, yeah. Um, so the next guy who's going uh, is Steve Allfelder. And the most important thing you need to know about Steve Allfelder is that Sarah McCoy is going to be in the tent over there. <laughs> oh, oh, Steve. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't see you there. No, uh, Steve Allfelder is the, uh, the Edgar Award losing author of uh, Purgatory Academy. That, that means he did get nominated for an Edgar Award, which is pretty cool. So if, I, if I'm catty, it's only out of jealousy, Steve. That's all. Uh, so he is, he is delightful, and I hope you stick around. Uh, I will be signing books somewhere, and otherwise, I thank you very much for your time.